Hey guys, Moms Against Medical Bullying. Put me on 1.5 speed because we're going to read a little bit more of Bechamp's experiments. We have already superficially studied the rigid experiments that establish Bechamp's views on the fermentative role of airborne organisms and of those found in chalk. Let us now follow a few of the innumerable ex experiments he carried out in the establishment of his other conclusions. His work was so incessant and his observations so prolific that they can only be summarized and no attempt can be made to trace the exact chronological order of the experiments upon which he based his opinions. At a very early stage of his researches, he demonstrated with Professor Esser that air need have nothing to do with the appearance of bacteria in the substance of tissues. Further, these investigators established the independent vitality of the microzymas of certain tissues, certain glands, and so forth by showing that these minute granules act like organized ferments and that they can develop into bacteria passing through certain intermediary stages which they described. These intermediate stages have been regarded by many authorities as different species. We have seen that the basic solution of the whole mystery for Bechamp was his discovery of the little bodies in chalk, which possessed the power of inverting cane sugar, liquefying starch, and otherwise proving themselves agents of fermentation. The strata in which he found them were regarded by geologists as being at least 11 million years old, and Bechamp questioned whether the little bodies he had named Microzyma cre creatae could really be the surviving remains of the fauna and flora of such long past ages. Not having sentries at his disposal to test the problem, he determined to see for himself what would now what would remain now at this present time of a body buried with strict precautions. He knew that in the ordinary way an interred corpse was soon reduced to dust unless embalmed or subjected to a very low temperature, in which case the check to decomposition would be explained by the inherent granules, the microzymas becoming dormant. At the beginning of 1868, he therefore took the carcass of a kitten and laid it on in a bed of pure carbonate of lime, specifically, specially prepared and creosoted, while a much thicker layer covered the body. The hole was placed in a glass jar, the open top of which was closed by several sheets of paper placed in such a way that air would be continually renewed without permitting the intrusion of dust or organisms. This was left on a shelf in Bechamp's laboratory until the end of the year 1874. The upper bed of carbonate of lime was then removed and proved to be entirely soluble in hydrochloric acid. Some centimeters further down, there were to be found only some fragments of bone and dry matter. Not the slightest smell was perceptible, nor was the carbonate of lime discolored. This artificial chalk was as white as ordinary chalk, and except for the microscopic crystals of aragonite found in precipitated carbon, carbonate of lime, indistinguishable from it, and showed under the microscope brilliant molecules such as those seen in the chalk of Sens. One part of this carbonate of lime was then placed in creosoded <laughs> starch and another part in creosoded sweetened water. Fermentation took place just as though ordinary chalk had been used, but more actively. Microzymas were not seen in the upper stratum of the carbonate of lime, but in that portion where the kitten's body had rested. They swarmed in, the, in their thousands in each microscopic field. After altering the carbonate of lime through a silken sieve, it was taken up with dilute hydrochloric acid, and Bechamp thereby succeeded in separating the microzymas, which had been made visible 
by the microscope. At the end of this experiment, which had continued for over six and a half years, Bechamp followed it with another which lasted seven years, to meet the possible criticism that the body of the kitten had been the prey of germs of the air, which might have been carried in its hair or admitted into its lungs by breathing when alive, or into its intestinal canal. Bechamp now employed more rigid precautions. This time, in addition to burying the whole carcass of a kitten, he also buried in one case a kitten's liver and in another the heart, lungs, and kidneys. These viscera had been plunged into carbolic acid the moment they had been detached from the slaughtered animal. This experiment commenced in the climate of Montpelier in the month of June 1875, had to be transported to Lyle at the end of August 1876, and was terminated there in 1882. Owing to the temperature climate of Lyle, very different from that of Montpelier, which for a great part of the year is almost subtropical, the destruction of the body was much less advanced in this later experiment than it had been in the previous one. All the same in the beds of carbonate of lime near the remains, in one case of the whole kitten and in the other of the viscera, microzyma swarmed and there were also well-formed bacteria. Moreover, the chalk was impregnated with organic matter, which colored it a yellowish-brown, but the whole was odorless. In these two experiments, Bechamp found convincing confirmation of views that had been already suggested to him by many other observations. To begin with, they supported his belief that the little bodies, the microzymas of natural chalk, are the living remains of the plant and animal forms of which in past ages they were the constructive cellular elements. It was shown that after the death of an organ, its cells disappear but in their place remain myriads of molecular granulations or microzymas. Here was remarkable proof of the imperishability of these builders of living forms. Neither is the fact of their own independent life denied by a longevity under conditions that would debar them from nutrition throughout immense periods, since we find prolonged absent absentation from food to be possible even in the animal world among hibernating creatures, while the naturalist can detail many more cases among minute organisms, for instance, pond dwellers, which fast for indefinite intervals when deprived of water, their natural habitat, and fern spores, which also are known to retain vitality that may lie dormant for many years. Thus, whether confined within some animal or vegetable body or freed by the disruption of plant and animal forms, the Microzymas, according to Bechamp, were proved capable of preserving vitality in a dormant state even though the period surpassed men's records. It would still be possible for different microzymas to possess varying degrees of vitality, for as we shall see, Bechamp found differences between the microzymas of various species and organs. But over and above finding that the elements of the cells can live on indefinitely after the disruption of the plant or animal bodies that they originally built up, he considered that he had obtained convincing evidence of their ability to develop into life forms known as bacteria. If not, where did some of these uh, come from in the case of the buried viscera? Even if airborne germs were not completely excluded in the case of the kitten's body, the utmost precautions had been taken to exclude them in the case of the burial of inner organs. Yet Bechamp found that the microzyma of the viscera, as well as those of the whole kitten, had evolved into associated microzymas, chaplets of microzymas, and finally into fine bacteria, among which the bacterium capita capitatum appeared in the center of a great piece of flesh. Here Bechamp saw how wrong first the great naturalist Cuvier and after him Pasteur had been in assuming that, quote, that any part, whatever, being separated from the mass of an animal is by that fact transferred into the order of dead substances and is thereby essentially changed, end of quote.
By Basham's researches, it was seen that it was seen that separate parts of a body maintain some degrees of independent life, a belief held by certain modern experimenters who, unlike Bechamp, failed to provide an explanation. His experiment showed the professor how it is that bacteria may be found in earth where corpses have been buried and also in manured lands and among surroundings of decaying vegetation. According to him, bacteria are not specially created organisms mysteriously appearing in the atmosphere, but they are the evolutionary forms of microzymas which build up the cells of plants and animals. After the death of these latter, the bacteria, by their nutritive processes, bring about the disruption, or in other words, the decomposition of the plant or animal, resulting in a return to forms approximating to microzymas. Thus, Bechamp taught that every living being has arisen from the microzyma and also that every living being is reducible to the microzyma. The second axiom of his, he says, accounts for the disappearance of bacteria in the earlier experiment. For just as microzyma may evolve into bacteria, so according to his teaching, bacteria by an inverse process may be reduced to the pristine simplicity of the microzyma. Bechamp believed this to have happened in the earlier case, when the destruction of the kitten's carcass was so much more complete than in the second case, when the temperature climate of Lyle had prolonged the process of decomposition. Many, indeed, were the lessons of the indefatigable worker learned from these two series of observations. 1. That the microzyma are the only non-transitory elements of the organism, persisting after the death of the latter and forming bacteria. 2. That there is produced in the organism of all living beings, including man, in some part and at a given moment, alcohol, acetic acid, and other compounds that are normal products of the activity of organized ferments, and that there is no other natural cause of this production than the normal microzymas of the organism. The presence of alcohol, of acetic acid, etc. in the tissues reveals one of the causes independent of the phenomena of oxidation, of the disappearance of sugar in the organism and of the disappearance of the glucogenic matters and that which Jume is called the respiratory foods. 3. That without the concurrence of any outside influence except a suitable temperature, fermentation will go on in a part withdrawn from an animal such as an egg, milk, liver, muscle, urine, or in the case of plants in a germinating seed, or in a fruit which ripens when detached from the tree, etc. The fermentable matter that disappears earliest in an organ after death is the glucose, glucogenic matter, or some other of the compounds called carbohydrates, that is to say, a respiratory food. And the new compounds that appear are the same as those produced in the alcoholic, lactic, and butric fermentations of the laboratory, or during life, alcohol, acetic acid, lactic, sarcolactic acid, etc., that it is once again proved that the cause of decomposition after death is the same within the organism as that which acts under other conditions during life, namely microzyma capable of becoming bacteria by evolution. 5. That the microzymas after or before their evolution into bacteria only attack albuminoid or gelatinous matters after the destruction of the matters called carbohydrates. that the microzymas and bacteria have affected the transformation before mentioned do not die in a closed apparatus in the absence of oxygen. They go on in a state of rest, as does the beer yeast in an environment of the products of the decomposition of the sugar, which, uh, which products it formed. 7. It is only under certain conditions, particularly in the presence of oxygen, as in the experiment on the kitten buried in carbonate of lime, that the same microzymas or bacteria affect the definite destruction of vegetable or animal matter, reducing it to carbonic acid, water, 
nitrogen or simple nitrogenous compounds or even into nitric acid or other nitrates. That it, that it is in this way that the necessary destruction of the organic matter of an organism is not left to chance to cause to causes foreign to that organism and that when everything else has disappeared, bacteria and finally microzymas resulting from their reversion remain as evidence that there was nothing of what was primarily living except themselves in the perished organism. And these microzymas, which appear to us as the remains or residue of that which has lived, still possesses some activity of the specific kind that they possessed during the life of the destroyed being. It is thus that the microzymas and bacteria that remained from the corpse of the kitten were not absolutely identical with those of the liver or of the heart or of the lung or of the kidney. The professor continued, I do not mean to infer that in, demon, that in destruction affected in the open air, on the surface of the ground, other causes do not occur to hasten it. I have never denied that so-called germs of the air or other causes are contributory. I only say that these germs and these causes have not been expressly created for that purpose, and that the so-called germs in the atmosphere, dust, are nothing else than the microzymas from organisms destroyed by the mechanism I have just explained and whose destructive influence is added to that of the microzymas belonging to the being in process of destruction. But in the atmospheric dust, there are not only the microzymas, the spores of the entire microscopic flora may intrude, as well as all the molds that may be born of these spores. It must not be supposed that Bechamp founded such manifold views upon just two series of observations. From the date of his beacon experiment, he never ceased his arduous work in connection with microorganisms. Together with Professor Esther, he instituted many experiments upon inner organs extracted from fetuses obtained as a result of abortions. Here again, they had overwhelming proof of bacterial evolution from normal inherent particles, for while they would find bacteria in the interiors, the surrounding liquids which had been specific, specially prepared as culture media would be absolutely free from such organisms. They spared themselves no trouble. Space does not allow a more detailed review of their continual and varied experiments, such, for instance, as those upon eggs, in which, not contenting themselves with hen's eggs, they produced ostrich eggs with their hard, tenacious shells and subjected these to innumerable tests. All right, I'm going to stop there.